This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. Before we get our program started, I want to welcome members of our military who are tuning in from remote outposts over the Internet. Thank you for being with us again. And I want to take a moment to remind listeners that if you miss any part of today's broadcast, you can hear the full episode at RebeccaCosta.com. That's myname.com, where we archive all of our programs and where you'll find a contact page where you can make comments and program suggestions. Some of our best ideas for guests come from our listeners, so if there's a leader or an expert you want to hear from or has not been treated properly by the mainstream media, Email us so that we can get in touch with that guest and invite them to sit down and have an in-depth, fair, and intelligent conversation right here. In just a moment, former senator from Pennsylvania and candidate for the presidency of the United States, Mr. Rick Santorum, will be joining us to talk about some of the issues which are expected to have an impact on the upcoming midterm elections and why coming forward to make early endorsements may be the key to a GOP victory. But before Mr. Santorum joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. Richard John Santorum was born in Winchester, Virginia, and grew up in Berkeley County, West Virginia, and Butler County, Pennsylvania. He received his undergraduate degree in political science from Pennsylvania State University, his MBA from the University of Pittsburgh, and law degree from the Dickinson School of Law, now part of Pennsylvania State University. Santorum's first brush with politics came in 1970 when he volunteered for Senator John Hines. Later, he was, uh, while he was still in law school, he served as an assistant to Senator Doyle Corman. Upon passing the bar exam, Santorum joined Kirkpatrick and Lockhart as a practicing attorney. Then in 1990, Santorum was elected to the House of Representatives. And in 1995, he became the Senator of Pennsylvania, a position he served until 2007. During his tenure, the National Taxpayers Union gave Santorum an A for his tax and spending policies. After retiring from the Senate, Santorum joined the Ethics and Public Policy Center, became a popular television commentator, and continued to practice law. But many of you know Mr. Santorum as the affable candidate for the 2012 GOP nomination for the presidency. He took 11 state primaries and garnered more than 4 million votes before withdrawing from the race. According to the Capital Journal this week, the GOP would be wise to pay attention to Santorum as we move closer to 2016. With more and more blue-collar conservatives singing his praises, Santorum may just be the nominee to beat. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report former senator and fiscal conservative, Mr. Rick Santorum. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Santorum. Hello. Hello. There you are. Well, I was just sitting here waiting for you in <laughs> beautiful Miami, and it's uh, it's the South Florida Chamber of Commerce Day down here. So, as far as I'm concerned, you can take it all day. I was I'm just enjoying the weather. That's terrific. Well, in, in just a moment, I want to talk about your groundbreaking book, which has stirred up a lot of conversation amongst our leaders. But before I do that, I want to ask you to talk for just a moment about the upcoming midterm elections. We've got 33 Senate seats up for grabs, along with the House and, and several key governorships. So what, in your view, are going to be the deciding issues this fall? Well, I think clearly Obamacare is still going to be a very important issue for uh, for uh, for Americans and the uh, the problems that are associated with it, and, and we're, we're really just beginning to see those. And, and there, more and more, it's going to become evident that this system is a failure, and that government controlling the healthcare system was the wrong approach. And it's going to cost more, and it's going to it's going to cause uh, delays. If you like, if you like what you see in the VA system, you're going to see a lot more of that in the private system. And uh, and so I think that will continue to be a, a number one issue. And uh, I, the whole the economy in general, all of those things and what, what this administration is doing. But I, I'm hopeful that Republicans will not just run against how bad the Obama administration is on domestic policy and also foreign policy, but also lay out a positive view. And that's the reason I wrote the book, is that we, need to, can't, we can't just be against. We have to be for something and lay out a positive vision of how the average American is going to be able to live the American dream. 
That's exactly right. You've got to lay out programs and policies of your own. You can't just object to whatever the other side is saying. Now, according to the Washington Post, 2.8 million voters have walked away from both political parties. So the the fastest growing group of voters is the independent or non-affiliated voter, uh, which, as you point out, is the voter who um, is not being represented. Uh, So presumably... That non-affiliated voter is going to vote for one of two choices. Uh, so doesn't it follow that the candidate or the party that does appeal to those independents is most likely to win? Absolutely. And in fact, there was a, some data that came out of the last election that some 6 million people who were socially conservative don't, they weren't going to vote for Obama, but didn't vote for Mitt Romney, didn't vote for the Republicans. They stayed home. And I think they are talking about the same group that these folks just stay home and, and won't stay home unless you provide some uh, vision for, uh, for for them to rally behind you and support you because they're, a lot of these a lot of these people are disaffected. They're not the economy is not going well for them. They're they're not seeing the upward mobility, the chance for success, and they don't hear either party talking about it. But that's why I think a, a message a positive message is so important in this election. I agree with you. I think most voters couldn't relate to Obama or Romney, and uh, therein uh, lies a huge opportunity. Isn't the best way to appeal to, to the largest number of voters to stick to issues that we can all agree on, like energy independence, job creation, yeah. overhauling this unwieldy tax code we have, educating our youngsters so they can compete in uh, a, a new global economy? I mean, there, there's no shortage of issues we can all agree on as Americans. Well, that's why I tried to lay actually I tried to lay out of the book a a message that was not controversial it wasn't it wasn't partisan. I, I really focused on making sure that we had uh, issues that could unify us. Issues like you know uh, creating more opportunities with energy production, manufacturing jobs. I mean, that's you want to talk about it, something that could really unite the parties is try to focus our attention on creating more jobs for blue-collar Americans in the manufacturing sector. Uh, issues like education and creating uh, opportunities for those who, the 70% of Americans who aren't going to graduate from college, uh, how about opportunities for them to be able to get jobs and in, in, in training and skill sets that are necessary to get those manufactured energy jobs? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, Lou Dobbs, who is a staunch independent, he joined us here not too long ago. And, and he said that the GOP has got to return to this big tent strategy where you invite and include as many Americans as possible. Um, and in order to do that, uh, ha- don't Republicans have to stay away from these divisive and emotional social issues? I mean, is, is, is Dobbs right? No, I don't think he is. I mean, the Democrats don't stay away from them. They they, they embrace them, uh, and they are divisive. I mean, they're you know, uh, if you look at national polls, uh, it's a divided country on 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 most of these social issues. People feeling passionate on both sides. They don't they don't run away from. Them. They embrace them, uh, and they found out that you know what, it doesn't really hurt them. And and I think that's the the reason it doesn't hurt them is because they actually stand up for what they believe in. And when you have voters who are looking to see, well, who do I trust? Who's authentic? Who's believable? And you see one party running away from what they say they believe and the other party embracing what they believe. Well, who are you going to vote for? Well, I'm not saying run away from them, but you've got something like 65 percent of Americans saying that in certain cases they would uh, agree with abortion. So if you've got 65 percent of the country saying that, why not just, you know, say, look, that's fine. You know, you believe what you believe and we certainly have our beliefs. But let's get on to the, the, the common ground that we have, which, as you point out, is education, jobs creation and so on and so forth. I, I just don't see what good it does swimming upstream. But let's get to that in just a moment. We have to take a short break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more from Rick Santorum. You're listening to the Costa Report. Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data? 
and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data, and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile, and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM Big Data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. Every day our world gets more complicated. Not only is new information coming at us faster than we can manage, new regulations, technology, and the effects of globalization have made it much more difficult to succeed. That's why I wrote The Watchman's Rattle, a book that, for the first time, explains how complexity makes it hard to separate facts from fiction and eventually causes us to make important decisions based on unproven beliefs. And not just us, our leaders also fall prey to this phenomena. But here's the good news. Once you know the symptoms to watch for, you can safeguard against them. So please, go to RebeccaCosta.com. That's RebeccaCosta.com. And order your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. It only takes a few minutes and the shipping is free. That's RebeccaCosta.com. Do it now. You'll be glad you did. The sun is high in the sky, which means it's time to get your RV and trailers ready to roll. Hi, I'm Rena Mills, owner of RV Service Center of Santa Cruz, your locally owned RV parts and repair center with over 38 years of service to the Central Coast community. In addition to RV repairs, our qualified staff services and maintains boat, horse, and utility trailers, in addition to toy haulers. We also restore vintage RVs and work hand-in-hand with all insurance companies to ensure that your RV is restored to its original condition. Tune up your RV for summer with RV Service Center's pre-summer special. 20% off all parts and service. Call now. Get your RV and trailers ready to roll with the help of your friends at RV Service Center. You'll find us easy to reach and easy to use at 2525 Mission Street, Cross Streets, Mission and Swift Streets in Santa Cruz. Call us at 831-427-0881 or rvscsc.com. Shirt Crafter, your one-stop print shop, has been locally owned and operated in Santa Cruz for a decade, providing custom design services to help you build your brand. Shirt Crafter provides top-of-the-line custom screen printing, digital printing, embroidery, stickers, banners, business cards, and so much more. They carry top-quality brands of gear, from T-shirts and polos to sweatshirts and ball caps. Whether you're outfitting your softball team or team building for your business, Shirt Crafter has it all. So build your brand with Shirt Crafter, located at 111 Ingalls Street in Santa Cruz, or go to www.shirtcrafter.com. Or you could give them a call at 831-423-0537. That's Shirt Crafter, 831 831- Four two three zero five three seven. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Rick Santorum. And before the break, you were making the point that as a leader, you don't run away from social issues. But what happens when your position on social issues or your party's position on social issues become an obstacle to garnering votes? Well, I would just say this. Uh, If you look at the the Democratic Party, for uh, a long time, uh, the issue of marriage was not an o- was an obstacle for them garnering votes, but they didn't back away from that issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think their position on on God in the public square is a losing issue in America, but they don't back away from that. Mm-hmm. Um, and if the issue of, of uh, I, I would disagree with you on the issue of uh, of abortion. Uh, if if you take 
uh, people who are pro-life or pro-life with the three exceptions, rape, rape, incest, and life of the mother, yes. 60% are pro-life. So mm-hmm. I, I, don't, I just... Well, I, that's the point I was well, making is, a, is that a, they, they do hold out exceptions. Yeah, the, the, the point I was making is that they hold, when you hold those exceptions out for abortion, uh, you have a large number of people that are agreeing that in certain circumstances uh, they, they uh, do agree with it. Now, let, let's move on. You, you recently released a book called Blue Collar Conservatives, Recommitting to an America that Works. So uh, maybe you could take a moment to tell us who are these blue collar conservatives and what made you feel it was r- important to shine a light on them? Well, I, you know, I'm from Western Pennsylvania, and I grew up in an area that, uh, you know, is that Western Pennsylvania is very heavily Democratic area, southwestern Pennsylvania in particular. And uh, I grew up in a steel town, and uh, realized that over the course of my lifetime, a lot of those folks uh, didn't vote for Republican candidates, but their values were very similar to mine. They 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 believed in faith, they believed in freedom, they believed in limited government, they believed in strong families and the and the importance of family, all things that conservatives believe in and no work. And I always say conservatism is simply common sense. And and we just try to apply common sense to the problems that, that confront our country. Uh, and I think most Americans share those values and have that common sense. Uh, I, and those are the folks, in my opinion, particularly middle, in, middle and lower income Americans who share those values, are being left out of the equation by both the Republican Party and Democratic Party. Republicans tend to just talk to business owners and to job creators, <clears throat> and Democrats uh, are always about giving out benefits to people. And you got a bunch of people in the middle there who nobody seems to be talking to or paying any attention to. And, and frankly, those are the folks in the last uh, seven, eight years who have been falling behind, whose wages have been stagnant and uh, who aren't on the government dole on one way or the other, but are out there trying to scrape and, and, and make it and, and having a harder time doing it. Now, you point out that uh, when you and Mitt Romney were neck and neck, uh, Pennsylvania voters who uh, planned to vote after work, after five in the evening, favored you by up to 21 points, which is something that really threw the pollsters off because these were working Americans. Is that right? Yeah. If, if, if what was happening is election after election, there's the, there's something called exit polls that, that the networks use on election day, and they – and they question people as they come out, and they release their uh, report at five o'clock for all. Actually, at six o'clock for all the exit polls they've taken with people up to that point, and then they have the last tranche that they they release, but it's after the polls have already closed. And what what was happening is these networks released their six o'clock uh, exit poll numbers to the networks, and the networks would you know they don't release it; they're not allowed to release it. Mm-hmm. But they you know they send out information, they you know sort of suggest what's going well. These exit polls always had me doing much worse than I ended up doing. And, and you know, Romney would be winning, and then he'd lose, or he'd be winning by a lot, and win by a little. And so they started asking the question, when are you planning to vote? And because they figured somebody must be happening late. And they realized that uh, in Pennsylvania, the example, if you were voting before 5 o'clock, Romney and I were basically even. If you were voting after 5 o'clock, I was up by 21 points. So the folks who couldn't get away from work, people who were working people, uh, salary, I mean, uh, wage, wage earners were voting for me after they got home from, from, from work. Now, I think that speaks volumes for who supported you, uh, your candidacy. And it seems to yeah. me that if we really wanted to court hardworking, blue-collar Americans, we'd do what other countries around the world do. We'd put our money where our mouth is, and we'd make Election Day a national holiday so people can take a day out to study the issues and the candidates and put their kids in the car or ride the bus together and go down to their local church or school or community center, cast their vote for the highest office in the land. I mean, voting is about as as inclusive and patriotic an act as there is. So why not make something like a national election holiday one of the cornerstones of a GOP platform? Can't we all get behind that? I, I don't have a problem with that, but as you know, that states are moving away from that. Uh, yeah, just this past week, uh, the state of Oregon, for example, has all mail-in ballots. state of Washington, all mail-in ballots. They don't even have election days anymore. Uh, everything is conducted via mail, and, and now you're going to see uh, states moving toward uh, doing it on computer. Uh, and I, I agree with you uh, that the uh, the getting together of community and coming to the polling places and having that is part of the American tradition. I think it's part of being a, a citizen. And yet 
a, a lot of the particularly liberal states are moving away from that uh, because they think they can better crank out the vote, if you will, selectively by mail-in ballots. And also, you don't have to worry about voter identification. Anybody can fill out the ballot. So uh, it, it creates, in my opinion, a lot more opportunity for fraud. Well, uh, regardless of how people send their ballots in, I think that we make a big statement as a country if we say that this is this is such an important act. It's such an important decision the American yeah. people make. Uh, and uh, and because of that, we need to take time out. Uh, everyone is so busy. Yeah, my, it's it's, it's yeah, mothers my, and fathers working two jobs to put food on the table for their kids. Yep. Kids are stu- doing more homework than they've ever done in any other time in our education uh, system's history. Uh, people are, are starved for time. And, uh, and I think taking a day out to make these critical decisions is, is it's not that big of a deal, but, you know, increasingly we hear about how it's easier to manage smaller populations of voters, and that certainly is not in the spirit of our founding fathers. They wanted people to get out and vote, and they wanted communities to come together. So even if we do it by email, I still say I think it would be uh, very wise for one of the parties to make a move and acknowledge that people need that time. Now, you also make the point in your book that for every new job created, 75 people have been added to the food stamp rolls, uh, and also that prior to 2009, almost half the medical payments in the country were being made by state or federal government. So, yeah. uh, you know, we, we, we're in a bit of a, a, a what do I want to say? Uh, we're, it's almost as though we're waiting for the next wave to hit us, aren't we? Well, I mean, look, the, we've seen a dramatic expansion of the role of government in people's lives, and what people are figuring out it's just not helping. Uh, the, the, the bottom line is that wealthier people in America are getting wealthy. And the folks that all of this, quote, redistribution was supposed to help, it's not helping. And one of the things I propose in the book is to focus our attention economically on restarting the sector of the economy that redistributes wealth. And that's the manufacturing sector. I don't know if you saw, I think there was this uh, uh, company called WhatApp. Uh, that sold for like twenty billion dollars, <laughs> uh, and just a couple of months ago, and, yeah. and you know how many employees they had? Fifty-five. If fifty-five employees had sold, now if you had a twenty billion dollar manufacturing company, you know how many people would be working for that manufacturing company to produce twenty billion dollars of that? You're talking about tens of thousands of people. So, what what I'm suggesting is that we need to start creating opportunities for for companies that employ and generate wealth more broadly, and manufacturing energy. Those kinds of opportunities. That is, that is a good point. Manufacturing companies always create more jobs. Now we have to take another commercial break. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Costa Report. The crisis in the Ukraine is the latest global conflict to pit the United States against Vladimir Putin's Russia. While the Cold War may have ended, U.S.-Russia diplomacy is here to stay. Understanding this volatile new era is not easy. For many years, experts have been trying to explain Russia's new leadership, but cracking the inner circle has remained elusive until now. The American Program Bureau represents some of the most knowledgeable and prominent Russian insiders who are available to speak to your organization. Experts such as Mikhail Gorbachev former leader of the Soviet Union and master architect of modern-day Russia. Vladimir Posner, the dean of Russian journalism. Andrei Kosarev, the first foreign minister under Boris Yeltsin. And Pavel Palashenko, chief advisor for 25 years to Gorbachev, are available to speak at your next event. No Speakers Bureau offers greater insights into how Russia impacts our economy, our world, and our lives. To schedule these esteemed leaders for your next event, contact the American Program Bureau at 800-225-4575 or apbspeakers.com. Hi, everyone. This is Kay Swirling. MZ and I are quite proud of the station you're listening to. Quite frequently, I meet people who express their appreciation for KSCO, one of the few remaining independent, locally owned radio voices left in our country. Of course, this is gratifying, but it's very important that you understand and keep in mind that KSCO is made possible by three things. Advertising sales, book, hat, bag, and other KSEO gear sales, and in particular, longevity health product sales. You see, every time somebody in our audience purchases longevity products such as Beyond Tangy Tangerine or the Healthy Start Pack, 
That person is directly supporting our operation and making it possible for us to continue to serve our community. We feel good about recommending these products because they are of the highest quality and they do work. I know because I take these products every day and I can enthusiastically vouch for their goodness and effectiveness. I first heard Dr. Wallach's message about taking charge of your health through nutrition nearly 20 years ago. I strongly believe in nutritional supplementation over toxic prescription drugs and invite you to help yourself and help KSCO and KOMY by trying and using these products as I do. Visit kscoteam.com or kscohealth.com or call one of your local longevity distributors. For KSCO and KOMY, this is Kay Swirling. Weekday mornings from 6 to 9 a.m., Good Morning Monterey Bay gives you information and news you can use, like tips on travel safety. Five people on a maiden voyage from Monterey were between 10 and 15 miles off the shore of Bean Hollow State Beach and Pebble Beach when their vessel hit a whale. All of the occupants climbed off the boat and onto the rocks. And they were 15 miles offshore, and all of a sudden there were some rocks out there. We had a rock. Where were you? In an airplane. <laughs> One of those sky rocks. You mean a star? No. <laughs> like a dirt clod. <laughs> really? You were... Yeah, JetBlue, we hit a rock. <laughs> Terrifying. Don't miss Rosie, Rick, and the gang for all your news, traffic, weather, sports, and so much more. That's Good Morning Monterey Bay, 6 to 9 a.m. on KSCO AM 1080. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and today we're speaking with Rick Santorum. And before the break, you were pointing out that manufacturing jobs create large uh, pockets of uh, employment opportunities and have to be a part of any jobs creation program, uh, which begs the question, can we compete in manufacturing given labor costs, taxes, and the cost of living in the United States, And in, in addition to the fact that uh, automation technologies such as robotics are putting human beings out of work? The answer is yes. Um, there's been studies done that if you uh, if you exclude labor costs in America and compare it to our top 10 trading partners, uh, we're 20 percent more expensive than the rest of those con- countries. And so it's not labor costs. If you exclude labor costs, we're still more more um, more expensive because of our high. We have the highest corporate tax in the world. We have the highest regulatory compliance costs. We have the most litigious litigation system, and it's just driving manufacturers offshore, irrespective of labor costs. And so one of the things that that I focus on in in the book, Blue Collar Conservatives, is in fact trying to lower the tax rate for for manufacturers, reduce the regulatory burden, and create an opportunity for a level playing field. And and we can – manufacturers will pay the higher labor costs here because labor is better, number one. The, uh, the proximity to market. There's a whole bunch of reasons to be in America if you could create a level playing field in every place else. Well, let's talk about that tax code. I mean, we've got a pretty convoluted tax code, which makes it possible for a, a profitable giant like General Electric to pay no taxes, while the yep. middle and lower classes pay increasingly higher state and federal taxes. So from your perspective, what do we need to do to streamline and make taxation fair to the working citizen? Well, I think we need to do two things. Number one, we have to, you mentioned streamline. We have to simplify it. So we have to get rid of a lot of the complexity in the tax code, boil it down, uh, to just a handful of deductions that, that are important for, uh, for people to have some support from federal government, like health insurance, for example, or a pension system. Uh, but all the other complexity we need to get rid of, both on the individual side and the corporate side. So that's number one. Number two, if you think about, this is what Ronald Reagan tried to do back in the 1980s, and we sort of got away from it. And it's mm-hmm. a really good idea, which is let's try to tax labor the same rate we tax capital. You say there's automation will come in and replace workers. Well, why is that? 
because automation is cheaper because the tax code rewards investment in capital and doesn't reward investment in labor. And That's right. It rewards getting rid of labor. Exactly. I mean, it, but it rewards in a lot of ways. Why, we, you know, Obamacare, for example, makes labor more expensive. Why? Because you have to provide, you don't have to provide health care to the machine, but you do have to provide health care now to every employee. The tax rate, the top tax rate for workers is 40 percent. The top tax rate for capital is 20 percent. So if you look at what the government does in mandating all these things on labor that cost more money, and, and you look at other things that we do with taxes that cost, it's, it's the old saying, if you want more of something, subsidize it. If you want less of something, tax it. But we tax labor and we don't tax capital very much. And guess what? You're going to get more capital investment and less investment in labor. And that's why the unemployment rate remains high, even though the economy has recovered somewhat. It's also true that when you have a 75,000-page tax code and you have folks uh, that can afford to hire buildings of tax accountants to look for legal ways, perfectly legal ways not to pay taxes, and then you have the average American walking into a a tax accountant for $75 at the local shopping mall to try to get their taxes done, it creates an unlevel playing field and a predatory environment. No, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, look, we have to make some, we have to make these changes, and and unfortunately, there there really hasn't been a consensus. But I I really believe that a consensus can be formed if we if if we talk about the importance of the worker. And 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 I always say, you know, the Republican Party has always been the pro growth party, and that's a good thing. We need to be the party of growth, but we also need to be the party of the worker, and that's that's the that's the fundamental change. Well, let's talk about energy for a moment. We haven't had a comprehensive energy policy for several administrations. Um, isn't that another area where leaders need to step up and offer a clear roadmap that all Americans, blue-collar, conservatives, liberals alike, can support? Yes. And in fact, you know, we have really the first time in the history of the country since, well, since the Industrial Revolution, I shouldn't say in the history of the country, but the first time since the Industrial Revolution, we can actually have an energy independent country that we can produce. We have the ability now and the resources and the reserves to produce enough energy to provide for all the energy needs of this country. And we have a government that says, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're going we're to put up roadblocks, both in the private sector development of resources, as well as huge roadblocks, roadblocks on the public sector development of these resources that, that is going to make us continue to be energy dependent upon areas of the world that aren't necessarily our friends. And so, we have, we, have, we have the opportunity not just to create more energy jobs as a result of that, but to keep energy prices low. And if we keep energy prices low, it helps workers in two ways. Number one, it keeps prices low, so it keeps their the workers and you know, middle America and lower-income America spend a higher percentage of their wages on, on energy than high-income people. Yes. And secondly, and most importantly, the biggest incentive to bring manufacturing jobs back to America is low, stable energy prices. Natural gas prices at, 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 uh, at nas- international lows, as well as the stability of that price over time. And so if we can, we can prove to the manufacturing world that we're going to have stable, low energy prices for you know, a decade or more to come, and I think we can do that easily, then you're going to see manufacturers, and, and again, the tax code and the other things, they'll, they'll come back in droves to this. Well, we haven't even brought up the fact that uh, keeping those dollars that we ship abroad for energy uh, helps the economy and we keep it circulating here in our own country. As you, as you know, uh, longtime oil man T. Boone Pickens has been banging at the door uh, of the Republican Party to adopt this Pickens plan, which would allow the U.S. Yep. to stop buying even one more gallon of oil from OPEC within 12 months without disenfranchising a single environmentalist. According to him, if we convert 8 million 18-wheeler trucks, which are traveling up and down our interstate highways, to natural gas, which we have plenty of, we won't have to ship another dollar to the Middle East. And and the ROI on converting those engines is less than one year. So why not jump on a plan like that? Well, I I do support that concept, in fact, uh, and it's happened. I mean, it's happening probably slower than we'd like it to happen, but uh, they're creating this corridor. It's Interstate 80, which, of course, runs into Northern California. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they, there's a corridor being created for these transcontinental uh, trucks 
that that will create an opportunity for them to to go to gas natural gas and have the have the uh, appropriate number of stations along that that corridor to really develop that that natural gas corridor. Now the, the question is, can we get developed beyond that? And I think really the, the issue there is garbage trucks, buses, taxi cabs in urban areas that have you know uh, compressed national gas. They can use those those uh, natural gas resources to uh, to power urban vehicles, lowers pollution, and uh, again, uh, result re, uh, we have domestic Absol- fuels as opposed to foreign Absolutely. fuels. Absolutely, you know, this is where I think leadership steps in. If you can explain a program to the American people in under sixty seconds that makes sense. We're going to convert 8 million 18-wheelers to natural gas that are traveling up and down the interstate highways, and we're, and, and the ROI on those engines will be less than 12 months, and that's going to allow us to never have to buy another gallon of, uh, of oil from OPEC. You know, that, that can be explained in less than 60 seconds. Why don't we have leaders that step up and, and offer that as a program to the American people? Well, I, I do, like I said before, I have, and I did actually talk about that when I ran in 2012. But the bottom line is, even if we didn't do that, we still would be able to be energy independent and have enough oil and gas that's produced here in North America uh, to, uh, to power all the vehicles as well as uh, the manufacturing and other, and, and keep the prices low. So even if we didn't do that, we'd have the resources to do it. But we'd be in better shape, I agree with you, if we did do that. Well, we have to take our last break, but uh, stay where you are. We'll be right back with Rick Santorum after these important messages. You're listening to the Costa Report. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars, and I have a question for you, Scott. What goes into making Method Champenois Bubble? You know, it's a process that's really defined by the French government that we've taken and enacted into our wines, which really drive the quality of our sparkling project. So this is a process that the French government defines pretty specifically, and you remain faithful to that. Yeah, 100%, and in some places we push it a little bit. Now, how do the bubbles translate on the palate? You know, it really gives you that vehicle, that mousse for the character of the sparkling wine, carrying the fruit and the complexity. It's the expression of the wine. To find out more about Caraccioli Wines, visit us at www.caracciolicellars.com or stop by our tasting room in downtown Carmel, California. That's Caraccioli Cellars, C-A-R-A-C-C-I-O-L-I, Cellars, come taste the difference. Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM big data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. Vegetarians beware. There's a new sheriff in town, and his name is Sid. Sid's Smokehouse slings the best slow-smoke barbecue west of Kansas City. Are you ready for the best burger in Aptos? Our 50-50 Bulldog Burger is half smoked ground bacon and half black Angus beef. Or try the Reuben. It has house-smoked and cured pastrami served over rye with sauerkraut, Swiss, and French dressing. We're located on the Frontage Road off Freedom Boulevard. Give us a call at 831-662-2227. Or visit our website at SidSmokeHouse.com. We're open seven days a week. Hi, I'm Candace McLaren, and I'd like to invite you to the fourth annual Monterey Bay Master Gardeners Home Gardening Boot Camp. 
It's going to be held for one day only, Saturday, June 21st at Cabrillo College. This year's theme is Coping with Drought. We will have a day of seminar-style classes in water conservation, drought-tolerant landscaping, and a tour of the area's best hidden treasures, the Salvia Garden at the top of the hill. The one-day event is $40 per gardener. You can register for classes and find out more information at our website. Just Google Monterey Bay Boot Camp. Hi, I'm Pamela fugit hetrick the host of Money Moves. Cash flows and money moves, but do you find money moving out of your wallet faster than it comes in? Do you wish you had a personal money manager? Do your best Dirty Harry imitation. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? What do you think? Go ahead. Make my day. Pretend that your finger is your gun. Quick draw, aim, point, and straight ahead. Notice that one finger is pointing out, but you have at least three pointing back at you. You're the best person to manage your own money. To get the tools you need for the job, listen to Money Moves Thursday night from 7 to 8 p.m. As your host, I promise that each week, Money Moves will leave you with some tips and tools to help you manage your own money. Thursday nights, 7 p.m. for Money Moves. Remember, that's Thursday nights, 7 p.m. for Money Moves. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Rick Santorum, who has a compelling new book out titled Blue Collar Conservatives. So to this point, we've talked about manufacturing jobs, but let's address uh, startups and small businesses for a moment. We've had several business leaders on the program in recent months who've pointed out that the number of new and small businesses in the country has been on a, a decline, and this is a bad sign of what's to come. In your view, what do we need to do to foster high-paying jobs rather than low-paying wages? Well, on the small business side, I mean, the, the reason small businesses are, are hurting is because, unfortunately, both Democrats and Republicans have been uh, weighing in on the side of big business. When I say that is that you see these huge regulatory uh, regimes going to effect, like Dodd-Frank and Sarbanes-Oxley, and all of these big corporate uh, regulations that we, that we put on uh, corporations across the board. And big corporations love it. They love all these big, expensive uh, regulatory regimes. Why? Because they have teams of people who can comply with that. And it's just a regular cost of doing business. Well, if you're a small business person, you have no ability to be able to, to handle this. You have to contract. You don't have people inside your company. That's all, that's all they do, and they can't afford to do it. So in a sense, it creates a huge competitive advantage for big, big business. And so it drives small business out of business or, or makes it a barrier to even get in business. And so one of the things I've been calling for Republicans, we need to be, you know, we need to step away and step back from this cronyism that goes on in Washington, D.C. with all these, you know, licensures and regulations and everything that big business advocates for as a competitive barrier for those who come up who are small guys to compete against them. Well, you said it. Complexity favors large businesses. It it favors yeah. whenever you have complex regulation or overregulation, it favors the most resourceful, doesn't it? Well, it's it, right. And the most resourceful, obviously, by definition, is not the startup. <laughs> it's That's not the right. guy who's, uh, who's, who's trying to be the disruptor and, and the innovator in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the corporate space. So it's a, it's a real problem. And, and you know, I think Republicans have to learn a lesson. I hate to say this, but you know, for a long, long time, everyone thought, oh, the Republican Party is the party of big business. That may have been true at one time. It isn't true anymore. And by the way, big business does not support Republicans anymore. They don't. They they like Democrats. They like big, big government. They like the competitive advantages the Democrats give them. Now, how much of this emphasis on big business has to do with our failure to reform uh, how campaigns are financed? Well, you know, to be honest with you, big businesses have been intimidated so much in being involved. The, you know, the left has done a very good job of intimidating businesses to to not get involved in the political process, and and so you know you see you do see some wealthy business people get involved, but as a, as corporations, you're seeing less and less corporate involvement in the political process because the uh, the left makes them pay a price for doing so, and so mm-hmm. it really is not. It's, I don't think it's campaign finance at all. I think it, it has to do with. The, the media and the political intimidation that comes that the media focuses when a business does get involved. 
Mm-hmm. Well, businesses are smart. They go through uh, lobby groups and form other organizations. You know, there's layers and layers on how that money actually gets to a, a candidate. You'd be, you'd be surprised how few businesses do that. I mean, I'm talking yeah. about, I mean, individual business people. I mean, you're at like the Cokes or somebody like that. But as far as the business community itself, they are they have become intimidated by by the media at this point. Well, then the media must be doing their job. <laughs> I've always said they're they're they are the fourth branch of government and providing some well, I, minimal I disagree, o- oversight when they're doing it right. Well, I would disagree with that because what they don't do is they don't they don't handle the other side. I mean, they, if you look at what labor unions, for example, are doing and the huge amount of money they spend uh, on the uh, and they take from the wages of the worker and then they turn around and use it for political purposes, always for one party. Right. Uh, you know, labor union didn't used to be just for one party, but it is now. And so you, you, you it's 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 become an unbalanced playing field uh, from, from well of course and when you list the top donors the unions are right up there uh, with uh, the top contribu- yeah, yeah the top business one. contributors yeah. absolutely now we know that every time there is a conversation about leadership in the GOP and the next presidential election your name is at the top of the short list so uh, I have to ask you I can't let you go without asking you what are, what are your plans. Uh, I'm I'm seriously looking at it. I mean, I won't make any decisions till next year, but uh, this is something that uh, I feel like we, with this book and the, the campaign we ran last time, we bring something very different to the table. I think that's fresh and that uh, that reaches out beyond traditional Republican constituencies to, to broaden the base of the party. And I'm 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 excited about taking that message out, and we'll see whether it turns into a campaign or not. Now, I am a scientist. I I like mathematics. And I have looked over the mathematics of uh, your uh, your running against Mitt Romney. And the more I look at it, I would suggest to the GOP that if they will push to make uh, Election Day a national holiday and they will put them it put you up as their nominee, I would uh, I'm not a betting woman. My top bet is one dollar, but I'd be willing to make my top bet (laughs) that you would give the Democrats a run for the money simply because if they look at the statistics of how uh, uh, conservatives and particularly uh, blue collar and hardworking conservatives voted after five o'clock, the answer is right there in black and white in mathematics. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think as you as you think about that over the next uh, couple of years, I hope that that there are some GOP list, uh, leaders listening in today and they will do the math as well. Well, I hope I hope you I hope you're uh, I hope they're listening too, because whether it's me or somebody else, uh, we have to have a, a platform that is not just pro growth, but pro worker. And we have to start talking about working men and women and what we're going to do to create opportunities for them to live the American dream. And if we don't do that, we're, we're a party that's, that's not going to be around very much longer. We're not going to be relevant. I would ask both parties to have faith in the American people and put some actual fresh and new ideas out there on their platform. Uh, I'd like to see some ideas on how to solve our problems rather than just the finger pointing that we normally see during election year. Well, that is our time for today. But before we let you go, I, I do want to take a moment to thank you for your service to our country. And I hope you'll come back soon. Thank you, Mr. Centorum. What? Well, appreciate the opportunity. God bless. Thank you. If your station is leaving us after this hour and you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with Rick Santorum, you can drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and also at our website at RebeccaCosta.com on the contact page. And if you missed any part of today's interview, you can listen to the full program on Apple iTunes, Podbean, Voice America, and also the Costa Report website. Just click on the guest photograph on our website and listen from the convenience of your computer or your mobile device. And while you're at our website, be sure to pick up your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. Just click on the bookstore page where we've curated a reading list for listeners who are still curious, inquisitive, and want to understand this fast-changing, complex world that we're trying to navigate in a world where there are so many more opinions and unproven beliefs than empirical facts on which to base our decisions The best way to arm ourselves is with knowledge, real knowledge. And that's why we're on the air each and every week. And also why I wrote The Watchman's Rattle and why we curate a reading list which contains books from the most important thinkers in modern times. So go to RebeccaCosta.com and get The Watchman's Rattle. And while you're there, be sure to check out our book list. 
And before we close our program today, uh, there is one thing that I want to be sure that I do, and, and that is to thank the 3 million listeners who tune in each and every week to the Costa Report. And by doing so, that they've proven once and for all that we have had our fill of divisive rhetoric, which has done nothing but tear America apart. It, 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 is, it is possible to have a rational, entertaining, and informative conversation with leaders on the left and the right without stooping to accusations and name-calling and gotcha radio. And the fact that the Costa Report's become one of the most popular weekly news programs in the country, I think that makes the point. So we thank you for joining us each week, and uh, we're going to see you right back here in seven days on the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. And before I close the program, I just want to make a point to thank Mr. Santorum. I know he was in a limousine (laughs) on his way to the airport, and uh, it was a little bit rough to get that cell connection. But I want to thank Mr. Santorum, and I also want to thank AT&T for keeping that connection going for us. That was uh, an interesting interview with him, and I'm glad we had the time to speak with him. I'm sure we'll be hearing more from him as we get close to 2016. Now stay tuned for a second hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM big data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. The Green Movement claims that the Earth is threatened by...